It's page 29 in the Blue Bible, if you're going to use that. Genesis 30. Today's verses 25 through 43. title this message, He Will Provide. Again, going through Sunday school in Joshua 5, it just so happens in God's providence that one of the main themes was God's provision. And here we are. Don't plan that out. God does, though. He will provide. Genesis 30, verses 25 through 43. Maybe some of us need to hear this today. People of God, hear the holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of God. As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children, for I have served you, that I may go. For you know the service that I have given you. But Laban said to him, If I found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages, I will give it. Jacob said to him, You yourself know I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, What shall I give you? Jacob said, You should not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later. When you come to look into my wages with you, every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs if found with me shall be counted stolen. Laban said, good, let it be as you have said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it, and every lamb that was black, and put them in charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, the watering places, where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred, when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks, and so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and, and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus, the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants and camels and donkeys. Let's pray and ask God for his help with his word. Lord, we need your help. Please help me to preach your word with power. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. May all the words coming out of my mouth be nothing but truth. And Lord, help it penetrate my heart, their hearts, for your glory. Lord, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Look around the world today and you can easily see we live in some perilous times. Not everything is peachy keen. Some tough times, right? Wars, rumors of wars, there's inflation and supply chain issues, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts, you name it. And sometimes that can get under our skin a little bit. Sometimes that can create a little bit of worry. That can cause you to maybe wonder if things get really bad around here, how will I provide for my family? How will I provide for myself? Who will provide for me? The news in the newspapers love to concentrate on this. The world is fixated with this type of thing. What if the financial system crashes? With all this reckless spending, it will crash eventually. Then we're doomed, right? There's no way we'll be provided for at that time. What's going to happen then? Your provision 
is told depends on you, yourself, maybe the government, your husband, whatever. Fill in the blank, right? That's what you're told, but that's not true. We see in this text today, God providing for Jacob through terrible circumstances with all the quote-unquote odds stacked against him. Everything's kind of against him here. Laban going after him to keep him down, and yet God provides for him and his family. And yes, this provision of God comes through at times employers and husbands and wives and whatever other means and governments what we want to see today is the ultimate provision who actually provides through whatever means he chooses to is God. And he will always provide for his children. He promises to do that. And with this country seeming to go down the tubes with political instability and all kind of scenarios worrying people, right? We now don't know what a man or a woman is in this country. I mean, that's how bad it has gotten. We advocate the slaughtering of our own children in this country. We advocate for homosexuality, something God calls an abomination. If you're putting your hope in this country, if you're putting your hope in this country to provide for you, as much as we love the red, white, and blue, me as well, but if that's where your hope is, you're hopeless. I'm putting my hope in God, and I'm praying for my country as well. And today we're going to look at this and we're going to see God provides. And he provides through, not always the way he provides, but he provides through hard work or work in general. He provides despite circumstances, no matter what they look like. And he provides according to his promises that he always does. He provides through work. He provides despite circumstances. And he provides according to his promises every time. So let's look with this through work. We can see this in the text, I think, there in verse 25. As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you that I may go. Here it is. For you know the service that I have given you. And it's right there at the end of verse 26 where Jacob says, You know the service I've given you that I want us to first see. Now, if you've been going with us or tracking with us, you know that Jacob had served seven years for his younger daughter, Rachel. It's the bride price. Back then, you paid a bride price to, to the family to be able to marry a woman. He had no money. So he served Laban seven years as his servant, working for him, keeping the flocks for Rachel. And Laban was a quality guy. So what did he do on the wedding night? He took his daughter Leah that was unattractive and which Jacob wanted nothing to do with and substituted her. And he accidentally married her. So then Jacob, for 14 years, he has to serve for Rachel total. Another seven years for Rachel. But you notice here at the end of all that, I'd be pretty juiced up. I'd be pretty upset. Maybe I'm the only one. You notice he doesn't say, Laban, you rascal, look what you've done to me. You have cheated me. I am out of here. He doesn't say that. He just simply says, I'm ready to go. You've known the service I have given to you. Laban, I've worked hard for you. No matter what you did to me, I worked hard for you all these years. Just let me go to my own home now. Now, I know you shouldn't just take narrative portions of Scripture and just whatever they do, that's what we're to do. You, you shouldn't do that. Sometimes there's things in here that are there to show us what not to do. We saw that last week with Rachel and the mandrakes, right? The superstitious mandrakes she thought would help her conceive and bear children. Not what you should do. But there are other times when we see in the scripture some godly activity that is confirmed as a command in other places of scripture. We can pull from that for our lives. And I think we can right here with Jacob and his hard work. Listen to what Paul says in the New Testament in Colossians 3. 22 through 23. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work hardly as for the Lord and not for men. Paul is saying if you found yourself a slave at this time, not advocating for slavery, but if you were in that situation then, you were to work hard for that slave master as working for the Lord. How does it apply more today? Employees, employers. 
No matter what kind of rascal of an employer you might have, or they might be really great, you're to work for them as unto the Lord. There's many other scriptures on the importance of hard work, but this one seems so close because this is really kind of what Jacob was doing. Working for this cheat for so long. Doesn't matter if you have a great employer or a cheat like Laban. Doesn't matter if your employer treats you just fantastic or you have a liar and a deceiver like Laban. You're to work in those situations, not for them, but for the Lord. The idea of that we're always before the face of God. We're always in his presence. I think R.C. Sproul used to say, Coram Deo, right? Everything lived unto God, for him and through him and to him, or all things, his, all for his power and all for his glory, all of life to the glory of God, even our employment. That's quite different from the way the world views it, wouldn't you say? Maybe from how you view it as well. How does the world often view work? If your employer's bad, you're bad, right? If they cheat you, I'm looking for a way to cheat them. If they just treat you like a number, I'm going to skirt by, barely do what I need to do to, to just kind of get by without getting fired and still collect the paycheck. I don't get paid more if I do more, maybe. Work is a really a selfish, uh, self-desire fulfiller, and yet God just flips that upside down on its head right there. He says, I'm your boss. No matter your boss, work for me. Work for me. Keep your eyes focused on me. You guys ever had any bad bosses? Thankfully, I've had, pretty sure, all good bosses in my life. But there's some employers that aren't so good. Maybe they didn't treat you the way you thought you should have been treated. Maybe they cheated you. How do you respond in that situation? How have you been responding? How are you going to respond tomorrow morning when you walk into work and there they are? You think, oh, I've got to work for this person. But it isn't just employers, because some of you guys, every day's a Saturday right now. You're retired. So I like to joke with John. Say, every day's a Saturday, and he works harder than, than I work, and he's retired. He's always go getting it. But the question for you would be, what are you doing with God's resources, his giftings, the time he's given you? Because Paul said, whatever you do, Work hardly to the Lord. Whatever you do as to the Lord and not for men. The world views retirement as really, now I'm going to fish on my bass boat every single day. Or go, I can hunt every single day now. Or I can collect seashells by the seashore every single day. Retirement now is me, me, me. I'll see you on Sunday, maybe. But I'll probably be at the lake, so... But Paul says, whatever you do, whatever you do unto the Lord. That's how we got to view work, all of life, view it in that way. And God provides for us through many things, through, in this case, work. I mean, at this time, Jacob didn't have much, but he had what he needed, right? Laban kept trying to deceive him and keep him down, but Jacob had what he needed. God was providing for him and through work. But it wasn't always fun. It, I would say it wasn't fun much for Jacob at all. And sometimes the circumstances in our lives are not fun. And sometimes they get worse and worse and worse until we feel like we're surrounded by bad and terrible circumstances getting in the way of provision. And you wonder, where is my next meal going to come? And for you, or for anyone, I want to tell you, God provides and always will provide despite the circumstances, despite what you can see with your eyes. And I start getting that there in verse 27. But Laban said to him, if I've found favor in your sight, I've learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. Jacob said to him, you, you, know, you yourself know how I've served you and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came and it has increased abundantly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? So even here, almost taking a form of submission before Jacob, realizing Jacob has the upper hand now. He's ready to go. He says, I found if I found favor in your sight, please don't go. I'm doing really well because of 
you and your relationship with God. Now, what's interesting here, he says he's learned by divination. Laban does. Divination, sorcery, omens, all that kind of stuff is wicked and forbidden by God. We see in Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 11, many other places as well. But Laban doesn't care about honoring God. He, if you haven't been able to tell in this passage and through the time we've been working through Laban, he cares about number one and not God number one, himself number one. It's a question to whether he was just saying he did divination or somehow that occurred. It's hard to tell for sure. But what isn't hard to tell is Laban knows he's being blessed by God because of his close proximity to Jacob. Not that they're in a great loving family relationship here. No, they don't get along too well. But he's close to Jacob and Jacob's working for him. And God, that's Jacob's God that's doing it. It reminds me of one of the promises to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, which we read in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Listen to the promise. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I'll make a great nation, make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And here it is. And I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God told Abraham that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He told him that those who blessed him, God would bless. Those who cursed him, God would curse. Later shown that the promises of Abraham were, went down through his son Isaac. And now in Genesis 28, you see that now it's through Jacob. All the nations of the earth being blessed. The ultimate fulfillment of that, the ultimate fulfillment of that is in Jesus Christ. Where all the nations who put their trust in him would receive the ultimate blessing, salvation. But there's a temporal fulfillment to this as well. We see that people closely associated, we saw with Abimelech before, closely associated with the patriarchs are blessed in multiple ways. And here Laban may have thought pretty poorly of Jacob, right? He's my servant. He's my slave. I pay him, but he's, I really got the upper hand. He came to me with nothing. I have all these gods to protect me. He serves this one God. Whatever Laban thought of Jacob and his God, he knows his God is powerful and his God is blessing Laban because of Jacob. And you might think, well, then this passage should really turn out great then, right? Laban should just get on his knees and repent. Trust in the Lord. Submit to the Lord of glory. Start treating Jacob betterly, think, better. Things should really start to turn around here. But they actually get worse. Look there starting verse 31. This is Laban's. He said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, you should not give me anything. If you'll do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep. Every black lamb and, every, and the spotted and speckled among the goats. And they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later. When you come to look into my wages with you. Every one that's not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs. If found with me shall be counted stolen. Laban said, good. Let it be as you have said. So Jacob decides to strike a deal with Laban. It seems like Laban's interested in profit sharing at this point to keep Jacob there. Now Jacob knows what kind of guy Laban is. He's a cheat. He's kept Jacob down, you could say, and he will at any moment he can. So Jacob strikes up this deal and says, basically, all the oddball sheep and goats will be mine. All the other ones, the majority, will be yours. And Jacob suggests this deal, which is interesting because really normally the sheep and goats here would produce the opposite of what Jacob was going to have here. I mean, why do you think Laban jumps all over it in verse 34 and says, good, let it be as you have said. Laban probably thinking, what a deal and what an idiot. He's losing it. He's going to give me all those. He's going to take these rare oddball ones. Perfect. 
Why would Jacob do this? Now, for number one, he knows Laban's a cheat, and the coloration of these would speak for themselves. They're not going to be trying to take back something. It's going to be very clear whose is whose. But I think there's a more, way more important reason that fleshes out as we keep going. So look at verse 35 as Laban pulls a trick. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it, every lamb that was black, and put them in charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. You think your boss is bad. So Laban goes and removes the ones that Jacob would have had to start with. And now all Jacob is left with is the ones that will be Laban's. And they are going to interbreed. And yes, genetics, they would produce some rarities, but most of them wouldn't. Most of them would be of Laban. It seemed like Laban has the perfect setup. Like he's got Jacob in the trap. Like how in the world? Jacob has, what, four wives? That's another example of what not to do. We went into that before. Four wives, multiple children. I mean, how is he going to provide for this family, especially with these measly wages that should be coming? What you can see with your eyes, Jacob is in big trouble. He's going to starve. Right? Let's keep going. Verse 37. Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks and the troughs. They're in the watering places. And he keeps going on with the sticks in the stripe, and he's trying to breed them to get the colors he wants. Now, this is a little bit odd here. There's different interpretation of what is going on here. At this time, it was thought of in that area at that time that the females, when they were being bred, whatever they were seeing would influence their offspring's color. It seems like Jacob is bought into this. There is no connection that anyone is aware of that that's actually the case. Some will say maybe, as we see later, Jacob will have a dream about this, that maybe God commanded him to do it as a sign, possibly. Others will say, well, we just haven't figured out how that works. Maybe there is a connection that we have not figured out. Or others like me would say, Jacob was falling victim to what Rachel fell victim to last week with the superstition of mandrakes. Rachel thought mandrakes would get her pregnant, an aphrodisiac fertility booster, but it was just folklore. And here again, we see he thinks these sticks are going to help. But the key is God is doing this. It's not this. You say, well, wait a second. Verse 43. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants, camels and donkeys. Translating, Jacob got rich. God really blessed Jacob here. So it must have been from the sticks, but it wasn't the sticks with the tricks. It was really God who did it. God has been showing that. Remember last week, he blesses us despite our sin very often. That even when we screw up in our mixed bag of sin and faithfulness, God still blesses us in incredible ways. And he blesses here despite the circumstances, despite Laban's tricks, despite the sticks Jacob thinks is going to help, despite Laban's strategies, even despite Jacob's own strategies, he provides for him. Now, does that mean that because God made Jacob rich, some people, health, wealth, and prosperity preachers will bring that in and go, that's a promise for us today. Same God for us today. Not at all. God does not promise us riches. We aren't promised that. Philippians 4, in the context of God telling the church of Philippi how God has provided for Paul, says this in verse 19, Philippians 4, 19. And my God will supply every need of yours. Not, a, not every yacht you want or Lamborghini you want. Every need of yours. I have to go over with my kids sometimes the difference between wants and needs. I need this new toy. And sometimes I have to go over that with myself as well. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Matthew 6, 31 through 33, Jesus says this. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. 
But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God is rich. God has everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and beyond. But he doesn't promise us riches in this life. Some have them, some don't. But what he does promise is he will always provide what we need. That he does promise us today. He will always supply his children's needs. And he'll do it despite our circumstances. Despite what you see in your life right now that looks to the contrary. I will tell you from my experience, especially in the last couple months, I've been blown away at God's provision. Switching from two jobs to one job, I'll tell you who provides. God provides through all kinds of means, but he does it. He always does it. He always has time and time again provided for me and my family, and he will for you and your family as well, no matter what happens in this country. No matter what. But it all hinges on something. Working for cheats and working hard, it hinges on something. God's provision despite terrible circumstances, it hinges on something. It all depends on something. It depends on who? On God. And what we see next and lastly is God provides always according to his promises. Always according to his promises. Now where do I get that from? Well, think about it. Jacob was working for this cheat Laban for many years 14 years up to this point it'd be several more and i wonder i don't know if maybe you wonder how could he do that put yourself in his shoes i'd be sneaking out in the middle of the night day 31 or something i mean miserable for 14 years straight what would he do who would he concentrate on what could encourage him in all this how in the world could you stay that long for that man and work for him? What's the secret? I'd like to know. Well, I think the secret comes back to Jacob's dream. And who told him something there and what he said? You see, when Jacob, after he stole the blessing of Esau from his dad... And Esau wanted to kill him. He was fleeing the promised land to go here where he spends 14 years. And when he's on his way, before he gets out of the promised land, God shows up in a dream and says this to Jacob. Genesis 28, 13 through 15. Listen to this. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, which was the promised land at that point, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. God spoke to Jacob in a dream and promised him several things here. He promised him to the, bring him back to the promised land that he would someday bring him back. He promised him. That he would have offspring as the dust of the earth. Many children who would have many children on and on. He promised him other things. Precious promises for depressing days. Now do I think Jacob perfectly rested in God's promises all 14 years up to this point? Was a shining, glowing example of joy in God? No. Do I think it, did he always have at the forefront of his mind the promises of God and never lose focus? Probably not. But I don't know how he could work for Laban for this long and this misery, for this cheat, unless he was remembering the promises of God, trusting in the promises of God, counting on them, focusing on God to get him through this terrible time. God is with me. God sees me. God said he would take me back to the promised land. I must look and trust, wait and trust, wait for the Lord. God promised me offspring much as the dust of the earth. And even despite I've had wives I should not have had. Look, I still have so many children already. God doing what he said he would do. I can see some of that already. Encouragement provided. So what's the secret for us? To get through different difficult circumstances, right? That's where it comes down to. Great for Jacob. How do we be faithful to God? Through working for faithless people. Or in spite of faithless people. Or through failures or whatever. The secret is the same. 
as it always has been and always will be. The secret is Christ, to focus on Christ and his promises. Paul knew this. Philippians 4, 12 through 13, Paul says these words, I know how to be brought low and I know how to bound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret, oh, the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 12 through 13, who's the him? Christ. It's through Christ. The secret is Christ. It always will be. So how do you get through broken marriages, cheating spouses, debilitating depressions and diseases and temptations of all sorts? You name it. Sicknesses, pain. How do you get through it, especially when it just lingers and hangs on like these many years of Jacob serving Laban? Christ, that's how you do it. You focus on Christ. Christ has all strength and can and will give it to you when you rest in him, when you look to him, when you get in his word and look at his promises and trust them because of him. He's the one that gives them. He'll never let you down. Not once. He never will. He never has. It's not just a Sunday thing. It's not just a come Raw, raw pep talk sermon Sunday morning and you're good. Before you get out of bed tomorrow morning, as you roll over, before your feet hit the floor, stop a minute and draw near to Christ. Focus on Christ. Lord, I need your strength. I have no strength of myself. I need you. Help me, Lord. Help me. So how do you know God will provide for you? He says, he promises he will. I read a couple of them there. There's many more. That should settle it, sure. But you know how else you can know? Because he's demonstrated it that he'll provide for you. He's demonstrated it in Christ as well. Ephesians 1, 3 through 4. Listen to this. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Every spiritual blessing he has given us, those who are in Christ. You see, God does not only promise to provide every physical need that you and I have, but he has provided every spiritual need you and I have. How has he done it? In Christ, him coming for us on that rescue mission, him living that perfect life you and I could never live for one minute, him taking his precious, perfect life, offering himself up on that cross for our sins, bearing the wrath of God that should be poured out on you and me in hell forever. He drank every drop of that cup on the cross. Our sins right to him became sin for us, all taken for us in Christ. Laid in that tomb and up from the grave, he arose three days later, defeating sin and death for us, victoriously, triumphantly, and all who trust in him, he won. All who trust in him, we win. Our sin's gone, forgiven. That wall of separation, because of our sin, removed the veil torn. God giving us the Holy Spirit, not living out there somewhere, but inside of us. To give us power to live the Christian life. He's given us everything we need in Christ. He loves us. And because he loves us, we love him. We are his children now. We have heaven awaiting us. We have him walking with us every step of every day, whether you know it or feel it or not, he's there. And if he would do that, if he would do the unthinkable, almost unbelievable, if he would do that for us, won't he provide everything we need physically in this world as well? Absolutely. He says it and he's proven it. And in our lives, he's proven it time and time again, brothers and sisters. 
So whether you're in the dark night of the soul right now or you're, things are going smooth for you, whatever your position, focus on Christ, the source, the provider of everything we need, everything we have. He will never let us down. He will always provide for us in life, in death, in great times, in terrible circumstances, no matter what. So I leave you with this. Are you focusing on Christ in everything in your life? And are you trusting in him to provide everything you need? If not, now's the time. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, he'll provide. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone in here who does not know you, you provide them with the rebirth, Lord. Regenerate their hearts, save them. Lord, for all the brothers and sisters here that we often struggle at times, trusting to you to provide when we see so much around us, when we watch the news for eight hours or whatever, we get down. Lord, help us. Encourage us. Get our eyes focused back on you. I need it and I know they do too. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is going to be 498. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. 498, if you'd stand and sing out of the hymn, no one you have it. <laughs>